in the 1800s, our ancestors managed to keep them alive. And when they imposed the new form of way of life, a new government, our teachings and our customs and our love and our practice became secondary or it became almost invisible after that. Lakotas never experienced any mental health issues from the 1851, 1860s, all the way all to the, as far as you can remember, our ancestors never had any mental health issues. Even though our history books has told us a lot of horrifying stories of massacres of our people. When we go back there and take a look again, our ancestors that were part of the world they knew how to take care of themselves spiritually. They never had anxiety. They never had trauma. The only trauma that we experienced is today after we learned what happened to our people. We learned to be disappointed. We learned how to hate. We learned how to be angry. The mental health issues among Lakota never came through to us until the 1950s. That's when we first started to experience our people experiencing PTSD, anxiety, and depression, and bipolar issues. And the wawakha that was given to us, the wodhaye that were made for us by the medicine people, had became invisible. We gave the power away. We gave it the power away, the, all the energy that we, can, we carried ourselves became secondary when we start, our people started using the substance abuse alcoholism and drugs in a different way of life. A completely colonialism generation and we're trying to struggle, we're struggling trying to revive and keep the voices and the teachings of our ancestors. So we are suffering in that way. But the Lakota people understood back in those days that the suffering, Lakota people believed that the circle of life or spirituality grows just like anything else. So your circle of life is very important. That's where your spirituality is. And we don't believe in death and dying. So Lakotas, we only know, experience when somebody passes away. Even today, in general, when somebody passes, so and so, Kigalelo, he left for the spirit world. They never said anything about life ending, but old Machata Yalo, our ancestors, the language and the meaning was when you lose a relative, even though it's really difficult and shocking and, and a hard time, it brings you to the acceptance of the teachings that our ancestors unmanifested. And when a child is born, Lakota, a child has arrived. They didn't say it was born, but he has arrived. They were talking about the spirit of that child. The manifestation was part of our culture. And that makes you a little bit easy understanding our spiritual being. So when you have a spiritual circle and you're sovereign about it, when you feel like you are sovereign enough to take care of your own spirituality, then you're a very healthy human being, spiritually. You're like the tree. The Lakota Wawichala, the tree is very sacred to the Lakota ancestors and the winged nation and the four-legged and all the animals that crawl on the earth. Our deep respect for each relationship that we have in there is because of our spiritual circle. So the tree is a symbol of the human being. Yeah? You're like the tree. Yeah? When you learn to root yourself like the tree, 
they're rooted in the ground, then you're starting to become a strong human being. Your emotions are in a rightful perspective. Your spirit and your teachings, your language is become filtered through those trunk of those trees of your own that you'll know how to say things to the right people, to the people how to say it the right way, to earn the respect and the integrity. So today in the modern world, uh, the life we live in, all of our people, everyone, we're controlled by the numbers about your ability to live in the modern world. You wanna buy a nice car, you wanna buy a nice home, you go there and apply for financing, go to the bank or whatever financial institution. They're not going to do a background check on them and say, hey, where's this guy from? Is this guy a chief or is he a, a good person? They're not going to say that. They're going to measure your credibility by some numbers, by the numbers about if you don't reach certain amount of scores in your, it's like a game, the way they put our life perspective. If your scores are low, then uh, they might not let you finance a good car. That dream about you driving a nice Cadillac kind of went away and you'll be going back to your one-eyed Ford. But uh, our credibility is controlled by some agencies who care less about the human being. They don't care who, who you are. All they know is your social security number, your date of birth, and your name. And then you measure your score. If you don't pay your bills on time, then your score goes up, you know, lower lower and, and uh, they, they consider you not worth helping. Now, where we came from as human beings, our credibility is how we relate to that tree of ours inside of our spirit. Your credibility is based on honor, integrity, and respect. And that, they call it that acceptable. Your credibility kind of raises up to an exceptional matter. Uh, where families can trust you, the children can trust you, and then you earn the right to speak and teach. But if you don't, without judgmental, we learned how to judge ourselves. And that was a real deep stepping stone for our people. It divided us away. So when you have a person going to share something, because of our bad teaching, they'll say, oh, hey, honey, no, hey, he did this long time ago. What's he doing out there? From the foreign teachings, we learn to judge our own relatives. And our hope that we, our, our growth of our spiritual teoshpai kind of became lacking, became a suffering. So Lakota, Wawichala, is there's a good suffering and there's a bad suffering. When the good suffering is when you see a person dedicate themselves to help others and to be humble and be honorable, his credibility was good, but he's also suffering in a good way for the people. And then when a bad suffering happens to us as Lakotas, we allow unhealthy things and we leave ourselves open. We allow our past life to drag us down our self-esteem, we gave it away. We did not acknowledge our own power. The Lakota spirituality helps us regain our power. So that's why we always say mitakwe oyasi, is that acknowledging our ancestors, our relatives, those are our relatives, we don't judge them. But we put perspective things in the right way, to everything that goes in the rightful way. We accept, we know our ancestors knew already, everyone, the most beautiful people that you have ever experienced is your neighbor, your relatives. The Rsichanghu Ayate are probably one of the most beautiful people in the country, Indian country. Oglalas, the Lakota Oyate. But we were victims of masterminding war in a psychological way where they separated all of us when we were supposed to be a strong nation. In South Dakota, if we, our ancestors kept away, we would be the majority people in that state of South Dakota. All of the Sioux tribes would unite. The Teotihuacan, the Teton nation, 
was a strong one nation. And there's just only one band of seven other bigger tribes, very bigger bands. So Dakota, Nakota, Lakota Oyate was one of the strongest and um, uh, united people. But when the, when the 1930s, when they established tribal governments, everybody started becoming separations. And he says, okay, you want your job, or they'll say, Taglayo, go back to Cheyenne River. They, they separated us psychologically. It works really well. So we all thought we were all different tribes and different people. So that is why we are suffering today. So we want to rebuild our nation. Um, we have to think about, think outside the box and the energy that cooperates our energy. So one of the major, you know, stepping stones of our spiritual being, uh, a medicine man that's going to be in training a long time ago, the first thing they do is put him on the hill and they, they plant a cedar tree right where he's at. It's part of the school, like they're going to the college to earn a degree. You imagine that towards the Lakota value, Lakota spiritual healer. And there's a real good reason why that tree is next to that person. If he goes out for a number of days and the fear, the fear has to be overcome. And at the end of that schooling, he has to go to a minimum of at least seven years of training, at least minimum. And he learns the first year as a young child the spirit of that tree, no matter what kind of tree it is. You learn to be patient and you learn to be tolerant. The teachings of to tolerance and patience. And you can't mindfulness. And uh, when our people get up in the mornings and they cook their breakfast and they eat breakfast, the, if they're mindful people, they will take their time enjoying their breakfast. Every bite, every drink, they don't go, they don't think outside their place. They don't think about the past. But the important value is being right here presently. The mindfulness is one of the requirements about common human being. So those are the teachings that we have forgot. We have become one of the greatest things that happened in this generation is we have a lot of medicine men, a lot of spiritual leaders and practitioners, which is a good thing because we know that they're there with their chanupas and they will pray and uh, we don't judge each other because it's good that there are a whole bunch of them around here now because at one time they were they were invisible it wasn't too long ago when you never heard about a medicine man you never heard they were either prosecuted or they put a bad label on them and they think about the worst things about them and they, they make sure they disappear so today, when you have a lot of young medicine people, then we're, we're kind of hopeful. The old people, where's uh, And then uh, we try not to judge them, even though they might, some might behave differently and on, you know, un, uncomfortably. But the, the ideology is that the nation still has connection with their spiritual beings. There is medicine women from the history so that is how the sweat lodge came to us of the original teachings. Now throughout the Teton nation, the, throughout the Teotihuacan nation, there were only seven medicine people in existence from, from the original when the Lakota can remember. The seven medicine people, we still utilize their teachings to this day, to this very day even though we may have forgot their names, but back thousands of years ago, in the 1400s, the very first medicine person was known, was the very first Lakota healer born in the 1400s 
was a Buffalo medicine person, Kakanka Oyate. And the story was that a young Lakota man was on a journey. He went on a journey and he went, but when people go on a journey, they don't just go around the, you know, from Rosebud to Mission and come back, you know, to them. And today we think that's a long journey, but back in the old days, around 1400s, when you go on a journey, you're, you're talking about hundreds of miles for a daily walk, you know, away from your people. And it takes about 405 days a year to put your thought process in the rightful perspective. So this Lakota man was on a journey and uh, somewhere along the way, he met out of the blue, out of nowhere, there's no one else, no other humans, along the creek, he met a woman, just, a, just them two in the whole world. And the man was very honored that to see another human being and to top it all off, she was a woman, which uh, that was his greatest day in his history. Thank you, thank you. And here the woman, she said she was on a journey just like him. And they both got along real well. Back in those days, everybody was honorable people. Now, if that was today, something else probably would have happened. James, diving in. What's that? But, but back in the old days, the man really honored that woman and never questioned her physical presence. They lived together, a whole month went by, and they spent time together. But the whole time, the man and the woman held on to their personal boundaries. They never crossed each other's boundaries, but they held the ultimate respect for one another. And here one day, the woman said, We've been together for two moons now, and now it, it's time for you to meet my people. So they went to an area where there was a lot of people standing around, sitting, and people were laying down, and just a comfortable place where all the people were there. They looked older. And here, those are the woman's parents. He introduced, she introduced him to the parents and the people. The man and the wife acknowledged their daughter. She was gone for a long time. Thinking about spending my life with him, he's a good man. The mom and dad honored her statement about saying, okay, also, the man said, we're going to let you live with my daughter make a family. Back in those days when you say tiwahe is a very honorable thing. So don't abuse her and treat her with respect and you will live a long time. If you don't, we will know. If you treat her unhealthy and you know, abuse her, we will surely come after her. You will lose your right to have a family. Now, back in those days, when they say that to you, it's, it's a really something deep that you have to pay attention to. When you lose the right to have a family, it's one of the nightmares of every man's life is when you have lost your family, is a horrifying experience. To this day, that ideology still stayed with us. But anyway, the man and the wife, they walked away from those people, and now he knows that he has a wife, Kawichu, Hassani, 
No. Hey, huh? Back in those days, they don't say Tawichu or Higinaku. Those are derogatory words that we use today. You know, my cousins used to say, Do I need Tawichu? I used to say, Oh, huh? Ka, ka, yo, they look. But then when I figured out that word, I, I, I said, oh, you mean Mahasani, my other half. Now you have two spiritual circles, your circle and your companion circle. When you put them together, you develop a spiritual circle of Tiwahe, a deeper companionship. Two circles come together, kind of like a MasterCard, you know, two, and your credit limit is unlimited and is very powerful. Your clout of living in the world between companionship is forever. And you spiritually, you grow, you grow. You just don't stay there. You grow with the world. And it's temporary. Someday you'll get old and one of you will die and the other one will follow soon. But the generation that you produced by the union is very sacred human beings. Which I, when they walked away, Gritasha looked back and here, those people that were all there, her family, they were all the buffalo. Those people turned into buffalo and they went over the hill. So now he knew that his new companion is not just all human beings, but it was a privilege from the buffalo nation that they gave a weon to the people. There was a purpose for it. It's not just the companionship but it was to develop a seed of a sacred energy. The bad suffering, she became, the woman in that union became a healing method so that when we encounter problems, there's a way to get well. There's a way to reach out to the energy. And back in those days, it was well understood that everything has power, the trees, and the plants, the water, the fire, everything, the wind. Our individual power. So they went on and he took her back to his people and she introduced her to the people, Yuha. Back in those days, it was very honorable to bring somebody back the first thing they do is they introduce them to the relatives. Okay. So the sisters, he had sisters and he had family, cousins. They gathered all the goods. They which means that they honored the woman that we that came into the family. It's, it's an honorable gesture. They give her all kinds of gifts, blankets and hides and all of really important values. The deeper meaning behind that is that she's accepted into the family. So they were living together and they had a son, but deep the whole time they were union together, the man was never forgot that she he came from the Buffalo nation. But something was, there was a problem. There was an issue. Because she wasn't all human beings, there has to be some type of a sign that she's not a natural human being. She, did, she didn't socialize with the Tioshpa. She kept to herself. And she stayed in a tipi where they, where they live. Just a child would come out and play with everybody and be, be well known. And the man would go to the events and gathering, but she would stay home. She just stayed around her cheapy, kept it clean and cooked for him when he comes home. She was a beautiful woman. There was no bad judgments against that woman. But the people found a way to talk about her. Aia, wo aia gossip about her, find some bad things. So they say things to her, you know, they didn't accept her in. After a while, she became part of the household gossip. She thinks she's good or all the things that you can talk about, what 
our daily conversations today that took place back there in, in the thousands of years ago. As human, it's just a human problem, human habit. So pretty soon things got worse. People write signs on their TP graffiti and all kinds of stuff. So one day, Nawiyah, early in the morning, she got up and she cooked her for the husband and the child. You cry, okay. I'm going to go home. Okay. So we touched her. Okay. He got up and he listened to her. She said to him, your people are not nice to me. I hear them talking about me. And they create stories. And they won't be very healthy for me to live with you here. So today, at the end of the day, I'm going to go home to my people. But I want you to take care of my son. And my son will someday help you. And then she started walking away. She packed her things. And they all, uh, the man and the son followed her to the place where they were all alone in here. She turned around and she hugged her man and hugged her child. And of course, they all wept a little bit, cried. A little. And then she went into a herd of buffalo that kind of came up on them. There was a lot of them. And she turned, she op they opened the door circle and she walked in the middle. And the, the buffalo all took her. She turned into a buffalo and they all went away. So the man and the boy, they didn't grieve or they didn't cry because she didn't die. She just went to another world. They didn't know how to take that. But he followed instructions because his love for her was very strong. He never did anything wrong like he was prom he promised. So he took the son and they went home. And after the while, the people started asking him, where's, where's the Wewoka? Where's that woman? And he didn't, he didn't answer them. He was angry at them, but he kept, his, he kept his honor. He says, when you're not needed somewhere, you go away. That's all he told them. And they felt kind of guilty and they felt sad. And he said, Tell, bring her home. We were sorry for being that way, you know. But it was too late. She was long gone. But throughout the years, as that boy grew up, sometimes he will disappear, be gone for days, and then he'll come back. But he was stronger than usual boys. And that boy had some power. They first, they first started experiencing power. When people were sick, that boy would go over there and pray for them and take care of them. And he became a well-known little healer. He a little powerful little boy. You know, that boy grew into a man, young man, and he got married. And from that marriage, they had two boys and a girl. You can help. Somehow, the boy told his dad, as they came from different animal nations. Which are the first boy, the man's Kakoja, he became associated with the Shunka Khan Oyate, the horse nation. His specialty was healing people with spirit problems, mental health problems. It was very rare, hardly ever, but he had uh, teachings of how to how to connect with the horse nation. And the second child, the girl, had relatives and had power with the elk nation. He had power that way. So the woman became a healer, the medicine woman. And they understood that she brought some teachings. And she told the people that the women were guided. Every female born in this world is born Wakam. And that still applies to us today. That the women nation, they have a guardian spirit that watches over them. The energy that they came became even more stronger certain time of the moon when the woman starts her monthly cycle, she became an instant healer, a very powerful human being. And they, they carry a power energy 
that can really mess you up if you're not careful, or they can make you a very healthy human being. They have the energy that carries in their body, their mind, and their spirit. If the woman uses her energy right, a man can be suffering, but he can restore that person today and build him to be a confident, well-to-do human being. Just a woman, a simple woman, have that energy. So she brought that teachings to the people. And uh, the weon was to be honored from the girlhood to the womanhood. Now, from that day, the womanhood ceremonies came to our people. The weon, the story can go on and on about broken women, how they heal, and the women, how they help decide rebuilding a nation. And then the last boy, Hokshila, his young boy, playing out there near, he heard a voice. He says, Tiwahe, Mishnabul Hawa Chinesh, Mahunkesh Nilo, Omakin, Telo, Akin. He was looking around for that voice, and he was a little bird. Kubaki, like a Wachpat Hanka, Lakote Wachpat Hanka, a special bird was broken wing, but he was lonely. He, so he said to the boy in Lakota, if you help me build my nest, I will bless you and I'll be your friend forever. Together we will be Wotakuya. So he did, he followed instructions. And today we take it for granted that we, we climb a tree and we see nest in those trees. And you know, so us little guys, we didn't know any better. We take that nest apart and really study it or play with it. But to the Lakota people, Wahokpi is a very sacred, it's like a pipe. It's powerful like a pipe. Any bird's, any eagle's nest is not just made by any twigs, but the eagle and the bird use what they call zinkatkacha, a special willow, special twig that was made for a nest. Sometimes a female and a male bird will work together every day until they have a nest because something sacred is gonna come through that nest and the birth of the new bird, the generation, the eggs. So the boy decided to help this bird build a nest and put it on a tree where it cannot be disturbed. And then he wiped himself off with sage and made sure that the the, the nest is very sacred. He helped the bird. He put the bird inside of the nest. And then he's left him alone. And almost a year later, the bird recovered and was able to fly. A man that blew, you know, painted himself blue, came to him one day and he says, here on after. Your home is going to be like a nest. And every day you will be responsible for making that nest. You do everything in your power as a man to protect your nest and make sure it's safe so that the female can make a life in that nest. From that day on forward to today, when the spirit relatives comes from the spirit world to visit the medicine in the altar, and they will talk about your home, they always say, Wahokpi Nitkawa, Wahokpi. They call our homes Wahokpi. And he says, uh, the deeper meaning from the Wahokpi is a very sacred place. So that still applies today, for today is the common man. It is our responsibility to build a sovereign home, sovereign, Igaluha, Tiwahe. You build a home, even if it's a tent, you will take responsibility to build a tent for your loved one, but it will grow. A humble start, you'll have a nice house. You'll have a nice secure home. You work on it every day. Your children will be born through that home. Your nest will be stayed sacred today. So from that day on, my grandfather's Wopdukha and Kahonska horn troops and moose camp, when they have ceremonies, they don't use just regular ceremonies for their altar. They use Zintgat Hatshan. is a willow that grows 
and it it's kind of extinct it's kind of hard to find but i found out that it grew all over the place in rosebud country so that's why i stayed around there i'm not just kidding but uh, the the willow of Zen God has a connection to our ancestral world. So from that day on, when the Lakota pray with the Chanupa or from the ceremonies, they always pray to the horse, the West. The West. When the East, they say Elk Nation, in the South, they say Wakupakoza, the Wing Nation. They're all related from the tiniest Wakpatanka all the way to, to the eagles and the condors of our relatives down in South America. All of the Wing people. And the story went where the Wakpatanka and the Wing Nation had a huge gathering on top of the they call it the Devil's Tower. The winged people gathered there at certain time of the year, all of them from the pheasants, grouse, little birds, snowbirds, all the way to the condor. No one knows the limits they have when they get outside, fly beyond the clouds. But they gathered there and they blessed the world, the human being. And they took it upon themselves to save the human being's life. The bird that we pay attention, we don't pay attention to, they fly all over the place. They're here because they keep us alive. By doing that, they go to work every day. The bird sits on top of the tree, manages to find the seed from that tree, and goes out in the oblaya, digs a little hole and puts that seed in there, covers it thinking that he's going to come back and eat it later, but he never does. So the years passed and that tree, that little seed in the earth becomes a root. And then it grows and grows and grows. And someday you'll see a tree growing up over there. And the tree, the energy and the power of the tree gives us oxygen. And that's how we live. We can't, life will be very impossible to live without a tree. But, uh, Lakota knew from thousands of years ago that the Devil's Tower was there for millions of years. It was a tree at one time. And the roots from that tree is still alive today as we speak. And that turned into a petrified rock. But it's still a gathering place for the Zinkawayate. And today many tribes gather there in the summer to pray and to continue the teachings. So I just wanted to share with you that much. Uh, we will, uh, the messages that our ancestors get are walking on Oyate, the energy from the thunder beings. And we understood what sovereignty means. It's not a, just a political word, but it's a spiritual word deep inside of our souls. When you learn to pray and have your loyalty to create a God in today's world, you don't lose track of your path. You became a sovereign. You will carry yourself with the teachings about a sovereign human being. So when we talk about sovereignty on our reservations today, it doesn't happen unless it starts from the, hum even the individual human being. Then you can call yourself a sovereign nation. Our Wahohis, our homes back in the 1800s, started from a sweat, long house, a teepee that was made out of leather, leather hides. And then the government issued canvas teepees to our people. And then the military type white wall tents and then our people learn how to make their own log cabins on the reservation. But the important thing was that every one of the process throughout the history, there may be umshika looking cabins and 
uh, dirt floor, no running water, but they were sovereign. They owned it. They don't have to pay rent. That was what, that's what made us a sovereign human being, sovereign nation. The 1889 Act and 1868 and 1851, 1877, all those acts, if you read them carefully, they said that as long as Indian, Mr. Indian, lives a sovereign nation, then the government is obligated to carry out the trust responsibility. So if you know of an Indian person on your reservation that lives by himself or by the family that owns their own home, makes their own garden, doesn't depend on anybody, then we have to do everything we can to keep that guy alive because that's what makes us a sovereign nation. Without the existence of the sovereign practice, we, would, we can become an extinct. Our reservations can be terminated. So today we have a lot of beautiful houses on our reservation nice houses, basements, and propane, well heated. But they don't belong to the Lakotas. They belong to the government. 90% of our homes today are Wahokpis, are owned by the tribal government, which is part of the United States government. And we have to pay rent. Nkolota, Olota, Onyanka. We don't pay rent. They'll kick us out. So 90% of our, technically, of our tribal members living on the reservation are homeless. We don't own our home. We have, we, we are living in abundance of the government. So it kind of took us off from our spiritual thought away from another, another world. But it's a sad picture, but it doesn't have to be that way. The tribe, the people, Oyate, can form their own sovereign community and build houses for people that will give it to them. The government should have just given it to the houses and said, here, that's our obligations. But they didn't do it. Instead, it became a business. And the tribes created a housing authority, and you got to pay your rent there, or you'll be thrown out in the cold. So there's a big change in our life. So we have to, when we want to rebuild a nation, those are the things that we have to talk about. The social welfare of our people. We have to take care of one another. We don't want to use a foreign model. We want our own Lakota master's degree in social work created in our university here. A Lakota model. Or tiwahe ta'om chaje, Lakho wichom chaje, aka unkompi muchim hata, so I just wanted to share those things with you and the uh, next time we get together we will talk about the language and the Lakota alphabets that they used to use and uh, the sovereignty of our language and the third one is how can we apply all that today the messages that our relatives have died young, whether it's on the highway or from drinking, driving, the messages that our young people have done by committing suicide, every one of them left a message to all of us. Some of us got it and some of us didn't. It went completely over our heads. But before they died, they left messages to everybody. It is our responsibility to read the messages pick the messages and fulfill the wishes of their, the people that had written them, send the messages for our children, for the younger generation. We have to do that today. Remember everyone in this country, Rosebud, Oglala, everywhere, you come from proud people. Our bloods are very sacred. We come from the most beautiful nation that you can imagine anywhere in a country, we're living in it right here. But sometimes we get ourselves sidetracked from the negative energy. We hear the medicine men having several wives over there, messing around with their, we hear our relatives, tribal leaders, and you know, associated with bootlegging or drug dealing. We've got drug dealers in our country. Don't let them get sidetracked here, that's their business. 
And that's their, someday they'll answer to that themselves. That's not ours. Keep your sacred circle, individually circle, stay loyal to God. Our nation will, re, you know, live. Our nation will revive and our strong communities will come back together. We are at the turning point of making these changes. The women have to form their own women's council. We've got strong women leaders on the country, in our country here everywhere, Lakota wins, Lakota Wichashas. And the biggest enemy of our nations is that we lose our spirituality and they replaced it with ego. So the worst thing that you can do today is put a bonnet on a chief because right away he forgets the people. He might become ego. He might become something different because it's not his fault, the world that was created to us by the government. So it's up to the people to keep our chiefs in line, feed them once in a while, bring them home, set them in the middle, honor them. They, they call it wiggly atskewi Now that doesn't mean that you have to give a greasy stew to them, but you cultivate the spirit of the leadership and you you say good things to them, remind them that we're all together. He speaks for all of us. So that way, our nation will survive. So is there, a, I'm gonna leave, uh, turn it back to the host and uh, if there are any questions or comments, uh, I'll leave it open now and uh, 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 we'll, we'll continue our, our session. Oh, huh. thank you, Richard, for, uh... Oh. sharing that that with us a uh, lot of good teachings a lot of good words you shared so we're very grateful to be able to listen to you and listen to that wisdom today um if anybody has any questions right now we'll open it up and and uh you could uh, you could uh, ask those questions you might have um everybody who didn't send their their email to the chat please put your email address in the chat room and there's also a link in the chat room for evaluation and at this time, if there's anybody who would like to ask any questions, uh, we'll open the open the mic up for that. Thank you. Looks like we have a question in the chat, Richard, uh, from Hattie Horselkin. She wanted to know if you knew who the last known 
um, medicine woman was? Um, to my knowledge, um, there were a few of them. They're in the 60s, late 50s and 60s. And uh, one of them uh, that I knew of for sure was uh, a woman out of Ring Thunder. Uh, I believe I believe her name was uh, Maud, Maud uh, Eagle Bear or Maud. Uh, uh, they call her Maud Jack. Uh, she was known a medicine healer, uh, and she uh, was married to one of the grandpa's uh, hornships for for a while there until uh, hornships passed away, and then. Uh, there were several of them, others on the reservation, uh, but they were also in disguise, you know, that uh, they kept important teachings. And uh, the medicine women are very important because uh, in, in the modern world we live today, what is empty is the we are, what can we, we the, um, the healing, the healing that from the trauma, from the past life, when the young girls have been abused or broken, um, <clears throat> the, the medicine woman would be very important to do the healing. So it was very encouraging to have uh, a medicine woman today. We believe that as long as we live life today, there'll, there'll be medicine women they just have to go to school for it. You know, the school is the teachings of the culture and the ceremonies, understanding the ways. And, uh, but they're important that uh, we lost them for a while and it was, it was kind of sad, but uh, a lot of the, the Buffalo healers, uh, we don't know of anymore. Uh, we have the Wambli Loa, the elk and the Wambli healers, the horse healers, uh, today we have uh, a lot of medicine men, but I'm not sure where, where, what category, what power they they carry. But uh, everyone has their own vision and their and their own teachings. So uh, it's it's best to know them information. But uh, we live in a real tough world today, where the majority of our young women and women are suffering from from being broken. But I think that's going to change when they're when the women decided to take that role. Uh, they, they have played an important role in our history. The women uh, was the one that pretty much brought our culture back to us in the seventies, uh, when everyone, all of the reservations across North America were uh, victims of the substance abuse, and we were. We were all uh, suffering from that. It was it was a, a woman that uh, encouraged uh, young warriors to come together and and uh, start looking, finding a different change. And uh, so that's the important part. All of our ceremonies, the women in play uh, important part. The sun dance, uh, the women, the young girl, the sweat lodge represents the woman's spirit, woman's body. Uh, the hunka, the relative making, the wiping of the tears, and, uh, all of those teachings. So we oh, are uh, was calm. So, but today a lot of women forgot about that, that, that who they are. Uh, I'm sure um, a lot of you remember uh, uh, Matahanshi, uh, French's, French's cut. He used to be an uh, instructor or part of the staff of the Sintagleshka. 
Francis come from Wambly, where I grew up. And his father and his grandfather, his grandfather lived till he was about 100 years old. And uh, uh, he was an information historian. He knew a lot of information. And I grew up around the 70s, you know, going high school and stuff like that. So I got a chance to uh, meet with uh, uh, the old grandpa, Ellis Cut, And uh, a lot of information about our history came from that, that elder. And uh, Ellis, uh, Francis Cutt's father, his name was Isaac. Uh, really a kind, nice man, you know. And, uh, you all, well, you know, you, you, you'll you meet him, you'll always be glad that you did. You know? uh, and he was a Heokha. He was a Heokha man, and even he didn't know it. He just, things just happened out of his control. And he was a teenager growing up. And uh, he was a, probably about 16, 17 years old. Uh, he was still living with his mom and dad. And uh, finally, the father, Ellis, got up one morning and he looked at Isaac. And he was, he was, he was laying in the living room. He was really tall. Did you forget your midterm? So uh, I told him. Go get it. Oh, yeah. He says, it's time for you to leave our home and make a make your own nest. You know, he kind of used spiritual language. Make your own nest. So that man, Isaac, was laying there. He was saying, oh, how, how? So then uh, after they left for the day, Isaac went outside, went down a creek, and he said, boy, am I going to be busy today? He says, he started carrying the little tiny branches one at a time. And, and uh, by the end of the day, he made a huge nest, big nest, bigger than an eagle nest. And at the end of the day, he was sitting in the middle of the nest, drinking coffee. And the parents came home and they were shocked, you know, says, oh, I don't wonder why a big bird would make his nest right in our house. You know, there was, what's going on there and here? It was Isaac. He had a nest built and he was sitting in there. So they were all laughing and uh, they didn't know that he was a Heoka. You got to be careful how you talk to people. And with him, he did tell him to build a nest. So he built a nest, you know, but he was supposed to build a house. You know? <laughs> so anyway, uh, I want to thank everybody for listening and uh, questions and I would uh, uh, I'll leave it up to uh, Mr. Baker and Marlis to uh, set up the next time so we can continue with the other training. But, if, uh, but I think that that probably be, if there's any more questions and if there's any more, then I guess uh, we'll, we'll uh, call it a day there, I guess, and, and uh, we'll go on from there. I want to just thank you, Richard, for coming, uh, for doing this for us. It, it's really wonderful to listen to you, to hear all of that history and these stories and the ones you just told about Francis's dad. Um, we'll share that with those young relatives that he left behind. So <laughs> that's really a beautiful story. So thank you so much for that. We, we all knew and love Francis and miss him. So yes. thank you for that and and just thank you for all your time today and you must be exhausted from talking and giving us all of this history and so please have a good rest and we'll um call you up and work with you on setting up another time just look at your calendar and see when you're available and then we'll set it up and send messages to everyone again and i want to okay. thank everyone for participating um this is really valuable, and I'm so happy you could all attend. Thank you. Oh, Wopila. Thank you. And you have Wopila Chichapalo. Take care of yourself and, and, and uh, pray. Pray often. That way, we'll all make it through this pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, Justin. Thank you. Thank you. Wopila. Wopila, Oh.